welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury. Today, the third in our four-part series of Back to School podcasts. If you're joining us for the first time, BioCentury's 2021 Back to School focuses on accelerated approval. Accelerated approval helps drugs get to patients faster for severe diseases with no alternatives using less data than normal on the condition that data collection continues after the accelerated or conditional approval. That decision can be modified, the drug can be withdrawn, or it can gain full approval. The pathway has been copied all over the world. On yesterday's pod, we dug into the first part of the pathway, gaining approval. Today, we focus on the second stage, confirming the evidence. Joining me to discuss it are... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Lauren Martz, Senior Editor. Stephen Hansen, Associate Editor. Simone, we've talked a lot this week about the stretch vision for accelerated approval. What is the stretch vision for this second stage of the pathway? I think this is a part of the pathway where you could really turn the thinking on its head. Right now, most people conceive of confirmatory trials as just that, confirming the evidence, like a box to check to get FDA to approve your drug. And actually, as Selena has pointed out, companies aren't particularly dragging their feet on this, but they still just really execute the studies in order to confirm what they presented in the trials that got them accelerated approval. In the stretch vision, you think about these trials as doing so much more, and you use them as a springboard for innovation. For example, rather than thinking of them as confirming that tumor shrinkage actually translates to longer survival, you could use them to identify which patients are going to receive the benefit and avoid giving the drug to patients that won't really get the benefit, but would still obviously be exposed to the side effects. So that's just sort of one example of how you could stretch the vision and turn these trials into something that really benefits the whole drug development pathway serves as a springboard. Lauren's going to go into, I'm going to pass it to Lauren in a minute to talk about biomarkers and real world evidence and how we get there. But I think the point is that if you use the trials to really understand your patient population and how to deploy these these approved drugs in that patient population, it would be hugely valuable to patients, to physicians, and to payers. And on top of that, companies can use these insights really to feed back into early stage development, propelling the search for the next therapies. So that really critically hinges on better deployment. And when I say better, I mean more thorough deployment of biomarkers. And Lauren, maybe you can pick up the conversation here and talk about the conversations you've had with drug developers and the investigations you've done into how biomarkers are being deployed and what the future looks like. The use of biomarker-driven drug development is definitely taking off, but I think it can be extended more into the post-market studies to to help refine the patient population, as you've mentioned. I think it's a lot more common to see biomarkers as exploratory endpoints in phase one studies. And in some cases, that's going on to guide later stages of drug development as well. But when we're looking at accelerated approval, the post-market setting is not yet the norm that these studies are looking specifically at biomarkers to refine the patient population. Last year, there was a spike in biomarker-defined populations for accelerated approvals. I think it was 42%. So it's certainly moving in that direction. So Lauren, I think what you're mostly talking about here is molecular biomarkers. We spoke to at least one person who was very excited about the potential for digital biomarkers and even digital technologies in these trials. Just give us a couple of words on that. Digital biomarkers in particular have a lot of potential in these kinds of studies. They allow continual collection of data. In some cases, they may even serve as alternatives to the primary endpoints. So you gain a lot of different information. And we'd be talking about things like wearables, right? (laughs) 
and they can monitor things like heart rate and pulse rate and start to generate data that's continually fed back. And we kind of are getting a sense that that's where things are going. It's obviously futuristic. We're not there yet. And it also leads directly into real world evidence, that big area. How how much is real world evidence being used now? And what are you hearing are the expectations for its use in the future? In confirmatory so trials, sorry. Yeah, in, in confirmatory trials, there's almost no use of real world evidence. So the post-market setting is somewhere that real world evidence is used outside of the accelerated and expedited approval pathways to monitor safety and even in some cases look at efficacy. But in terms of actual confirmatory studies that are, are fed back to the regulators, this is a place where we haven't seen a lot of real world evidence use yet. But I think everything is primed for that. In a draft of the pending 21st Century Cures Act, it actually says that real-world evidence can be used to satisfy some of those post-market requirements. I think one of the challenges in using real-world evidence in this type of setting is the data integrity. But there are ways around that. So if you're looking at these retrospectively, you have to try to find the right patients and try to find the right information that's already been collected. But there is an opportunity to look at prospective real-world evidence studies, like pragmatic trials, where companies can set those requirements up front, which patients to include, which data points to collect. And then you're in a situation where you can collect much more data for much more patients than you'd be able to do in a standard trial. So that might actually give you a better picture of how your drug is working rather than the couple hundred patients that you could include in a standard study. Right. And going back to the stretch vision, what you're doing here is actually getting better data, more data, and extending the trials and the impact of the trials well beyond just confirming if that one drug did what it was supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. A a much more heterogeneous population, better diversity, and seeing how the drugs are actually working in the real world where patients are taking different therapies and have other comorbidities. Cool. Interesting stuff. Uh, I'm going to do a pivot here and turn to Europe. We have our top European analyst on, Stephen Hansen, who is based in the UK for BioCentury. Stephen, I'm curious, how does EMA handle conditional approval? How does it differ from what we're seeing stateside? Thanks, Jeff. There's obviously a lot of similarities between what EMA and FDA are looking to do with accelerated or conditional approval. EMA has taken something of a different tact in that it has two different pathways, actually, that it uses for different types of therapy. The first was started in 1995, is the approval under exceptional circumstances. This is really targeting ultra-orphan therapies or, or, or areas in which you really can't have any expectation that you're going to be able to generate that confirmatory data at all. And so this is an opportunity to get drugs to patients where it might otherwise be very difficult. The second to come was the conditional marketing authorization, which they launched in 2006. And this very much falls in very similar to FDA's accelerated approval in that there is an expectation that you're gonna generate data that will confirm that the drug works and have it convert to full approval or not. One of the main differences here with EMA, though, is that conditional approval is only valid for one year. The requirements are that you have to basically apply for renewal of your conditional approval. And in doing so, you have to submit data to show that you are basically on track. You have to submit any new safety data or FC data and basically show that you are on track with your post-market commitments, which obviously applies a bit more pressure onto companies to maintain these requirements. But it also, I think, flips on its head how you look at making decisions in that post-market setting around whether something has been confirmed, such that really the onus is shifted onto the companies to continually demonstrate that basically the benefit-risk balance for their products remains positive. Whereas I think some would make the argument that in the case in the U.S., it's really up to FDA to have to make that call on when there hasn't been enough shown to really confirm that benefit. And so I think that really maybe changes the dynamic about how a company might approach really getting done to the confirmatory evidence that they need. A couple of things are really interesting about that. When we spoke to people, and this includes investors and drug developers, 
no one said this is too big of a burden. In fact, they all seemed to think that it was a good idea to have that responsibility on companies that they check in every year. And we also had at least one U.S. regulator say they like this idea. And rather than the regulator having to chase companies to do it, companies having to present the data, I, I think I should say, and I know that we mentioned this on an earlier podcast, even though the onus has shifted in Europe more to companies to fulfill their obligations, so far, the numbers don't suggest that there's actually a greater efficiency in those trials being completed via the EMA. It's also true that there's sort of a glut in the last two, three years, both in FDA accelerated approvals and EMA conditional approvals. So we may yet see that bear out. But so far, actually, it's not translated into greater diligence in executing that part of the process. But I, I do think that generally people think it's a preferable idea. Yeah. Would you agree, yeah, Stephen? Yeah. I do. And I think that has also evolved over time as well, because if we look at the history of the very early machinations of EMA and how they operated with this this pathway, you could maybe argue that EMA was much more risk averse in the very early stages because we saw instances where they were requiring 10, 12, I think 16 was the high point in terms of the obligation, the specific separate safety or efficacy trial obligations on companies, which obviously they've become much more streamlined and efficient, I would say, probably over the past decade now. So the hope would be that, that you would see more efficiency out of this, but you're right. The numbers, at least as yet, don't uh, don't bear that out. Stephen, I'm curious about some of the more recently instituted pathways, such as those that we're seeing in Asia, Japan, China. What are you picking up on there? So the interesting thing with those pathways is that they continue to iterate on what we've seen out of FDA and out of Europe as well, because where FDA and Europe basically stop short is that while there are agreed on timeframes for which the data, the confirmatory data is being produced, there is no hard and fast consequences for what happens if those timelines aren't met. Whereas what we've seen out of China and Japan, so Japan has a limited conditional approval pathway for regenerative medicines in which there is a maximum seven-year window to generate the data. And then in China, what the guidance says is that basically the company and NMPA agree on a time period for which the conditional approval is valid. And during that period, they need to generate the confirmatory data. And if that's not met, then the conditional approval is not renewed. So putting a much more hard and fast time limit on getting this data, I I think is that next step and that next iteration and essentially making sure that the concept of the expedited approval pathway is maintained. And those pathways are quite fresh, right? So I think one of them was in 2014 and one 2017. And so it's probably a bit early to find out yet or to take the temperature yet in terms of how well that's working. We don't really have enough data points yet to really see how that's panning out. But just from a conceptual standpoint, I think it's a very interesting idea and we'll just have to see how it plays out. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen, Lauren, Simone. Tomorrow on the pod, we'll dig into the third leg of the pathway, modifying decisions. And on Friday, we'll wrap up BioCentury's 2021 back to school package with our overarching essay that projects the stretch vision for accelerated approval. All of our back to school content can be found on our website, biocentury.com. All of our podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcasts. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.